Good afternoon and welcome to the Acton Institute. My name is Dan Churchwell and I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Program Outreach here. Uh, we're delighted you're here. We're thankful for all the benefactors that make these lectures possible. Thank you for joining us for the uh, May Acton Lecture Series. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Richard Turnbull. Dr. Turnbull is the Director of the Center of Enterprise, Market, and Ethics in the UK. He is also the Chairman of the Trustees of the Christian Institute, and he holds a degree in economics and accounting and spent over eight years as a chartered accountant with Ernst & Young. Richard also holds a first-class honors degree in theology, as well as a PhD in theology from the University of Durham. He was ordained into the Church of England in 1994 and served in the pastoral ministry for over a decade. As well as from 2005 to 2012, he was the principal of Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. He's an author of several books, including an acclaimed biography of Lord Shaftesbury. He serves as a fellow to the Royal Historical Society and is a visiting professor at St. Mary's University. It's been a delight. Um, Dr. Turnbull writes for Acton quite often. He's lectured for us several times uh, before, so it's really glad to have him back in country. Please welcome, give an Acton welcome to Dr. Richard Turnbull. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you here today and uh, a very uh, warm welcome uh, also from me and to those who are joining us online. I don't know whether any of you <laughs> ever had the experience when you're uh, giving a talk and you're waiting on the sidelines and the person introducing you is introducing you with the biography and you're wondering whether you've come to the right place. <laughs> very generous, thank you. Uh, Dan, I was last here uh, in March 2000. And 19, three years ago, you may remember March 2019, just at the beginning of that sort of outbreak of COVID. And I got the penultimate flight out of Chicago uh, back to uh, England. Given the, the state of a uh, 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 political situation in both US and in, in, and in England, had I not got back, then I might have been here for the whole of the three years. But uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, uh, with you. Uh, now, you'll see there on the uh, slide, uh, as well as uh, uh, taking the logo of the Lake Michigan Credit Union, you'll see a little uh, picture next to that of a little cottage in southwest Scotland, a little place called Ruthwell, uh, which you've probably never heard of. It's a tiny little place in southwest Scotland. In 1810, the location of the first ever savings bank in the world. Do you remember the piggy bank? Now, I distinctly remember as a child proudly dropping my coin into the top of the slot at the, uh, I'm just trying to get the slide to change here. Yeah. Yeah. A bit of assistance, uh, if I may. There we go. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, hopefully that will work from now on. Anyway, there's the piggy bank. Uh, and I distinctly remember as a child dropping the coin into the top of the piggy bank week by week as I sought to save up for whatever it was that had attracted uh, my uh, interest. Now, the origins of the piggy bank lay in uh, medieval times, uh, when households would uh, save coins into a container made from pig clay. And that's uh, why it developed in time into this shape of the pig. There was, however, one important and significant difference from the piggy banks of my childhood. There was no underside plug or hole to take the money out. So you put the money in, but how were you to get the money out? Of course, in our day, you might save 
Uh, pennies might be saved in a jar or in the piggy bank, but you can always get at it. You can raid the bank, but not in the original piggy bank. And this is why Professor Colin Mayer, who's uh, at the Sade Business School in Oxford, uh, said this. The fact that the piggy bank had to be destroyed to retrieve its money made its destruction a very deliberate decision. Savings were considered commitment to put aside money for a particular purpose or a rainy day. That was the precise meaning of breaking the bank. The only way to get at the money was to smash the piggy bank. But you can see also how that would convey a sense of prudence and permanence. The decision to break open the piggy bank was a specific and deliberate decision, not something to be taken lightly. Now, developing a culture of saving is key to the prevention of poverty because it encourages the key virtues of self-help, prudence, independence, and personal responsibility. Saving forms character, and the formation of character is itself an essential element in the avoidance of poverty. Uh, there's an interesting little bit of political uh, debate going on in the United Kingdom at the moment. I don't want to get into the politics of it, but uh, a little bit of political debate going on in the United Kingdom at the moment because a conservative politician, in response to a lot more people are facing food poverty and having to go to food banks, had the timidity to, timidity to say, well, why don't we help people to cook, teach people to budget, and teach people to accept personal responsibility? Uh, it was like the roof was caving in that someone would even dare to say that. Saving, character, all of these things are essential for the avoidance of poverty. Indeed, one might argue that the decline of the moral imperative of saving and its replacement by borrowing and debt to fund consumption is a characteristic of a society that has lost its moral compass and views poverty as simply an incidental hazard along the way, which it is someone else's responsibility to sort out. Nothing could be further from a Christian perspective. Well, let's consider, first of all, the purpose then of saving. Uh, saving, of course, uh, I don't know so much about the US, I know a little bit, uh, but certainly in the UK, saving seems to have fallen out of fashion. Uh, perhaps that is not entirely surprising after a prolonged period of low interest rates. And now with significant inflation emerging, there seems to be a continued economic incentive to borrow and spend. All of these things constitute moral hazard. Now, both the US and the UK have notoriously low savings ratios. And I've got for you the data, uh, the most recent data I've been able to obtain. So it's hot off the press from 2022. I should say quarterly data does sometimes vary up and down quite considerably, uh, but it does illustrate the, the point that I'm uh, wanting to make. So this is saving uh, as a percentage of household income uh, for the last quarter, or the, for the first quarter of 2022. Um, so in France, 17.4%, uh, Germany, 12.5%, Italy, 11.3%, all quite significant percentages, really. Uh, Japan, 29.9%. I, I have no explanation for that, um, uh, but a, a very high percentage. Switzerland, uh, 19%. And now let's go to the UK and the US. The UK, 6.5%. The US, 6.2%. Well, the numbers will vary. The ratios will vary quarter to quarter. But invariably, both the UK and the US find themselves at the bottom of charts and tables of saving ratios. But why would we want to encourage anyone to save at all? Uh, it, it, one of the things I spend a lot of my time doing in the, my own organization, the Centre for Enterprise Markets and, e and Ethics, 
is seeking to make the intellectual case for a particular course of action, uh, often informed by uh, Christian theology, but also by wider moral principles. And I think we need to re-articulate the case for saving, reminding uh, people why it is important and how we can encourage that to happen. Uh, so why save at all? In a sense, these particular arguments are not surprising or unusual, and many of you may be familiar with them. Oh, there we go. I'm finally figuring out how to do this. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, one purpose for saving is to postpone consumption. It's worth just thinking about that for a moment. Do you remember, people of my age will remember, going back to the piggy bank, you saved in order to buy. You decided as a household, as a family, you might need a new washing machine or you might need something new and you would save. You would put a pound a week, a dollar a week, ten dollars, whatever it was you could afford, you would find a way of saving that until you could enjoy the fruits of what you had saved for. What happens now? Buy now, pay later. Buy now, pay later, or possibly not at all. Buy now, pay later, and then reschedule your debt on some marvelous, wonderful offer that probably doesn't help you in the slightest. And it is one of the characteristics of folk who get into debt is very often it's a spiral that gets worse and worse and worse. So there is something character forming about saving as a way of postponing consumption in order to save for what we wish to buy. Oops, got ahead of myself there. Secondly, uh, a store against calamity. This is the saving for the rainy day when things go wrong. I doubt there's anybody in this I doubt there's any, anybody in this room or online who has not at some point in their life experienced a difficult time a difficult period where they've needed to dip into reserves in order to deal with a problem. I certainly have. I remember, uh, without going into too much grisly detail, a particular period of great difficulty in my life where I needed to use the savings that I had saved in order to see my family through a difficult period of time. To me, that's Christian responsibility but you need to have that character and culture of saving in order to make it happen. And uh, thirdly, uh, to smooth out income fluctuations, I mean, this is a basic sort of just economic uh, sort of concept, really. Uh, we are net savers or net spenders at different periods in our lives, uh, and it's the classic sort of income hypothesis. And so saving just helps you smooth out uh, those uh, variations. And fourthly, and finally, and very importantly, oops, there we go. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not allowing, I'm, I'm getting ahead, I'm not allowing the uh, screen to come up. Uh, fourthly and finally, encouraging aspiration. Saving helps us secure longer term security. It allows for investment, provision for families, for pensions, the uh, purchase of assets such as property. All of these aspects are crucial parts of encouraging aspiration. And if there's one thing that our societies need today, it's aspiration. If there's one thing that will challenge the idea of poverty, it's encouraging all people of all types, of all uh, uh, whatever distinctions there may be, to have that aspiration in their heart and saving forms a significant part of that. So you can see how in different ways each of these uh, purposes uh, of saving acts as a bulwark against poverty. Well, how then might we encourage saving? Are there certain characteristics of our current banking system which disincentivize saving? Short answer to that question is yes, there's a lot. Uh, more particularly, are there characteristics of savings banks, regional banks, credit unions, 
mutual societies that encourage the moral principle and the moral responsibility of saving. And the contention of this lecture is that there are key principles in what was once an extensive patchwork of local, self-governed savings institutions, which encouraged those virtues of self-help, prudence, independence, and personal responsibility through the moral principle of saving, and which have been increasingly replaced by large, national, global, impersonal, conglomerate banking institutions little interested in moral principles. Certainly in the UK, I think it is a little different in the US. I think there is a wider regional base in the US. But certainly in the UK, there's kind of five banks. If you ever actually want to talk to anyone in the bank, it's almost impossible. Five banks with little interest in who you are, where you're located, and uh, what can be done to help. So I'm going to take us back uh, to the Victorian era and ask then what possible lessons uh, could we learn today from that remarkable assortment of friendly societies, building societies, burial clubs, savings banks, and penny banks that characterized the lands landscape of 19th century uh, Britain. Uh, so a friendly society, effectively a mutual organization owned by the contributors, perhaps akin to a credit union, uh, is perhaps the best example uh, today. Uh, it might be to provide for insurance. Uh, it might be just to provide uh, different forms of savings vehicles. Uh, building societies originated, uh, this is a particularly British thing, I think, a building society, uh, originated in a group of people coming together to pool their funds to enable each person in that group to purchase a property. What a great idea. Now, of course, there are some problems because there was a long period of time involved before you got to the end of the, the, the 10 members in the group uh, purchasing uh, the last property. And uh, once that had been achieved, the first building societies dissolved. And then the idea came about that they should be permanent. And so some building societies, in fact, I'm going to quote from one a bit later, became known as the Leeds Permanent Building Society. It was there all the time to allow people to save to buy a house. What a great idea. Terribly simple, isn't it? What a great idea for encouraging uh, aspiration. Burial clubs, uh, uh, effectively people saving for funerals. Uh, uh, savings banks, uh, penny banks, and uh, so on. And perhaps we might come to regret uh, I'm not suggesting for one moment you can simply replicate everything that took place in the 19th century or any other century, but perhaps we might come to regret something at least of the loss of diversity in institutional and local provision for saving. Now, William Gladstone, four times Prime Minister of the UK, described in 1990 thrift as the symbol and instrument of independence and liberty. The symbol and instrument of independence and liberty. The penny bank, a savings bank designed explicitly to encourage the saving principle among the poorest, has been described as one of the most remarkable social phenomena of the 19th century. I've become increasingly interested in uh, penny banks and the way in which they operated for the social good in 19th century uh, Britain, far more effectively than anything that the state uh, chose to do. And I'll come back to penny banks later. Now, historians, of course, view the, view the phenomenon through different lenses. Was the idea of mutual association uh, a defensive reaction to life's risks, death, injury, sickness, so a negative reason to save, or was it a reflection of the greater capacity for both saving and consumption due to increased real wages? Uh, those two things are not incompatible with one another. They are both uh, different aspects 
of the moral principle of saving. But what is remarkable is the range of financial and savings institutions which inhabited the landscape. Self-governed in one way or another, appealing to different groups in society, encouraging prudence, self-help, and virtue. In other words, the precise opposite to the consolidation, centralization, and regulation that we find today. Of course, these movements of uh, mutual aid, uh, like a credit union today, were not without tensions or problems. And they were, of course, susceptible to fraud or even mixed motives run by the middle class, so the argument goes, in order to keep the taxation levels down for supporting uh, the poor. And uh, these aspects may indeed have uh, contributed to increased regulation and scale at the expense of independence and the local. But there was, nevertheless, a degree of flexibility and agility, a commitment to local communities, and a vision of mutual ownership, which makes these associations worthy of further thought and investigation. Now, the dominance of the role of the state today is so pervasive that it is easy to forget that as banking, savings, and other financial institutions uh, emerged in the 19th century, the presumption was that individuals were responsible for their own welfare. Mediated, perhaps, and not just perhaps, mediated, in fact, uh, through churches and voluntary societies, but with state aid, an inadequate and final result. And I wonder whether, uh, really, just as an aside, whether many of our problems today is not that the state has no role in supporting the weakest in society, but perhaps we've actually turned those things on their head and the state has become the first port of call rather than the last. Now, the concentrations of capital and labor uh, in urban centers and industrial uh, towns uh, naturally brought many challenges. Loss of employment through injury, sickness, or indeed just through the normal uh, fluctuations of the economic cycle. Structural change and the deployment of capital is painful. Uh, all of these things raise the spectre of poverty for individuals and families. One researcher, Zoe Lawson, has said, <laughs> oh, here we go, uh, there we go, got it. The fundamental belief underlying the savings banks was that self-help and thrift were the solution to poverty. Now, historians, as I hinted at a minute or two ago, commonly assume that these values were imposed by middle-class elites in their own self-interest. Keep control of the lower classes. Make sure that the poor rate, the uh, taxation for the relief of the poor, is kept down. Nevertheless, it seems to me there is a danger that we are so resistant today to anything that even remotely looks like paternalism, or to the idea of self-help, that we are in danger of quenching, quenching the dynamism of these friendly societies, saving banks, and other institutions of mutual aid. Another individual that I'm doing a lot of work on at the moment is a man called Thomas Chalmers, and uh, exactly uh, who basically instituted a whole series of uh, experiments in uh, 19th century Glasgow for the relief of the poor through principles of self-help. You read all the scholars today commenting on Chalmers, oh, paternalistic, oh, you know, middle-class imposition of belief. And actually, you've got to stand back from that. Uh, you've got to stand back and say, actually, if we dismiss these ideas in that way, we might be missing something quite significant. And I think we are. It, it is arrogant to claim that the middle classes were simply imposing their values on the working class. Funeral insurance, for example, was seen as a basic expression of decency in working class communities, uh, a, a basic principle that uh, individuals wished to provide for. And membership 
of a mutual organization, a friendly society, was a moral choice. Now, there is a case to argue that these uh, societies were flexible and agile, represented a place of autonomy for working class people, indeed, a place of social relationships. There was an independence from the state, uh, changing patterns of work and discipline, and at least the possibility for the working class uh, to save, uh, consciously uh, taking control of their financial affairs. Which I'm waiting to appear. There it is, it is very brilliant. Consciously taking control of their financial uh, affairs. And in the words of a handbill for the Leeds Permanent Building Society, which I uh, mentioned a few moments ago, laying the foundation of future comfort and ease. The real sense that these organizations were vehicles for working class formation and identity. And interestingly as well, not least in the sort of debates that go on uh, today, friendly societies and saving banks were instrumental in encouraging women and children to save independently. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes as we uh, get towards the end. Now, Penny Banks uh, illustrated the flexibility of provision by taking the savings opportunity to the poorest of the poor. And certainly from 1873, the Penny Banks Association was campaigning for penny banks in schools. Um, another of my uh, uh, areas of interest, the early installation into the youthful mind of habits and thrift and prudence cannot but be fraught with great and lasting good to the individual and the community at large. You see, today, everything gets compartmentalized. Education, finance, politics, religion. You know, you can, you can have your religion and I'll choose not to have mine. Everything is compartmentalized. One of the w wonders of the 19th century was that nothing was compartmentalized. And the idea is that you would have a school that would have in it a uh, school of industry where people would be employed in order to teach the children a trade. And at the same school, you would have a penny bank where the children would be encouraged to put literally a penny a week into the savings institution. It was a holistic vision of prudence, self-help, and responsibility. Now, naturally, uh, there were uh, complex uh, motives and genders, but virtue and prudence were values that belonged just as much to the working population, uh, reflected in the aspiration of the working man to provide for self and family, to save, to achieve a better life to provide a house and to ensure against disaster. Um, so in essence, uh, many of them, that's the friendly societies, owed their origins to the need felt by working men to provide themselves with succor against poverty and destitution, resulting from sickness and death at a time when the community offered only resort to the overseer of the poor. In other words, only resort to the state. Well, let me spend the last 10 minutes. I think I've got 10 minutes left, um, or at least I think I can stretch it to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, two, two things uh, to, to deal with before we finish. Uh, let me just say a little bit about uh, the rise of these voluntary saving societies and give you some uh, examples uh, of them in practice. Um, so... We had this wide range of societies, from burial clubs to friendly societies, savings banks, penny banks, and so on. Local societies emerged in local communities in order to respond to and enable provision for social need. And again, that's an important point, is the principle of locality. Uh, locality and relationships lie at the heart of these uh, institutions. Of course, there was regulation via various acts of parliament and registers of friendly societies and so on. And the history of this regulation itself reveals a tension between locality and self-governance in the societies on the one hand and the need to enforce standards and uh, procedures and governance against fraud and malpractice on the other. 
It's interesting when you start looking at some of the archive material, how many of these local societies valued their independence very deeply and rather resented the interference of the state. Let me give you some examples. Uh, in 1815, uh, some 16 percent of the entire population of Lancashire, big industrial county in, in the UK, um, uh, uh, belonged to a friendly society, but this represented 81 percent of families. So in other words, 81 percent of families in one of the biggest industrial regions of England had somebody in their family contributing to a friendly society. In Oldham, uh, a town uh, on the edge of Lancashire, centre of the cotton industry, 41% of the entire population uh, were members of friendly societies. And in that instance, over one third of the membership were women. These are significant numbers. Now from about 1810 onwards, there was a, a wave, uh, a rising wave of local savings uh, institutions across many of the towns of northern England in particular. By 1818, there were 283 savings banks established in England. Uh, by 1856, 467. And in respect of the smaller units, the penny banks, by 1867, there were 874 across the UK. And what is extraordinary and often overlooked is the range of mutual societies and their integration into local communities. They provided social fellowship, mutual support, and the opportunity for savings, not only for working men, but also for women and children. They were an essential part of the landscape, gave opportunity for community service, for example, serving as a trustee, and gave practical form to the ideas of saving and prudence. Now, uh, let me uh, uh, give a little bit more detail and then we'll conclude. Um, what is interesting uh, is how scholars have investigated the operations of particular savings banks. So Zoe Lawson, who I'd mentioned previously, looked at savings banks in Lancashire in the mid 19th century. Let me just run through a few of the things that she found. Uh, the account balances were small. Um, for example, in Preston Savings Bank in 1856, 58% of balances were under £20 and only 5% uh, above £100. Uh, savings banks provided, for the, uh, provided the opportunity for the accumulation of savings based on relatively small amounts. And very often, bigger institutions excluded those who were only able or willing to make small deposits. Uh, Lawson also noted the occupations of savers in Lancashire. Two categories stood out, uh, tradesmen and unsurprisingly uh, textile workers. By 1861, there were 1.6 million depositors in savings banks and total deposits amounted to 39 million pounds with tradesmen and domestic servants accounting for around half of the accounts. 12% of the accounts were held by married women, 15% by children. Now, interestingly, um, uh, Lawson, in her investigation into the, let me get this right, I think this was the Blackburn, a town in central Lancashire, savings bank, uh, in investigating the banking ledger of this bank, found that people, that the, the clerks had written in a memorandum column next to the depositors, the reasons why deposits were being made. And it's interesting just to reflect, albeit very briefly, on what those reasons given were. And there's a great affinity uh, to what we've uh, already uh, looked at. Uh, firstly, financial security. Just relate these back to those basic principles of uh, why save. Uh, saving for a better life, aspiration for new jobs. There's something, there's something happening here in this very idea of saving, of the opportunity that it will provide for aspiration and progression. Protecting money from others. That was uh, sometimes used by the women who perhaps wanted to protect w w the money from uh, a drunken husband, for example. Those 
uh, are taken directly from the banking ledger and mirror almost exactly uh, the principles we looked at before. Now, let me just uh, say a little bit more about penny banks and then conclude. Um, there was often a requirement for a minimum deposit, and this would exclude the poorest savers. And that's why, from 1850 onwards, primarily, the idea of the penny bank uh, developed, essentially gathering very small savings from the working class. Depositors could place anything from a penny to a shilling with the bank. And as I hinted at earlier, these uh, uh, penny banks were often associated with churches, mission societies, uh, schools, mechanics institutes. And so they form part of this landscape of voluntary societies, uh, the voluntary institutions of civic society, really, uh, in Victorian England. Uh, many of these banks took a geographical name uh, and were linked either formally or informally to bigger savings banks. So, for example, the Huddersfield Preliminary Savings Banks illustrates by its name, its idea was as a nursery to gather the very small deposits that the bigger bank wasn't interested in. And eventually these would accumulate to a larger amount and then be placed on deposit with the bigger savings bank. The Birmingham Penny Bank, established in 1851, grew to 13,000 depositors. Now, inevitably, uh, the penny banks faced some of the same issues that were faced by the wider savings banks. And in 1865, Glasgow Penny Bank adopted uh, uh, protocols that required uh, more than one member of staff to be present at the opening of an account, two records of every transaction, a weekly deposit in the savings bank, a balanced ledger and audit, audit every six months. Now, we mustn't romanticize these banks. They didn't necessarily operate like the banking network today. Uh, sometimes they had only very restricted uh, hours of opening. But they did very often open immediately after the payment of wages. And maybe I can just give this as the last story before I just draw the last few conclusions. Uh, uh, Lord Shaftesbury campaigned uh, against, uh, in 19th century England, the other alternative that used to happen. Because the other place that used to open immediately after the payment of wages in a factory was the public house. And what would happen is the workers would go into the public house and the inevitable announcement would be made was there was a delay in the payment of the wages. And so the landlord of the public house would say, but have a drink, have another drink, open a tab, run an account. And then when the wages arrived at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., at the end of that day, a very high portion of them had to be used to discharge what had just been run up as a debt uh, by a pub in which the factory owner would quite often have an interest. What a wonderful alternative instead to have opening its doors the penny bank, the savings bank, so that as soon as the wages were received, then the deposits uh, could be made. Well, we need to draw to a close so that we can have plenty of time for questions. So I just want to uh, uh, assess, really, this landscape of voluntary banking and financial institutions and ask what lessons we can learn for today. Yes, of course, the complexities uh, were many. There were issues of fraud and embezzlement which could collapse lo a local savings bank. Powerful elites could indeed exercise inappropriate control. Uh, re local independence, which sought to avoid regulation and inspection, did not always end well. And coverage was patchy. And yet, there are a number of positive characteristics of these institutions, the loss of which in today's centralized and consolidated market is, in my view, a real loss. I'm talking here, of course, about the principles uh, rather than a simple replication. Firstly, uh, a wide range of societies provided for a diversity of needs. Penny banks, saving banks, friendly societies, building societies, all aimed at different groups in society with different needs and aspirations. One size does not fit all. 
Uh, for some, a regular subscription for insurance against sickness was the priority. For others, a penny a week, establishing the idea of saving in the heart and mind and character of an individual. Secondly, local uh, governance and control. Regional and local management and control was an important characteristic. Most banks uh, carried a local name in the title. Remember my first slide? And I'd, I'd, I'd stolen the logo of the Michigan, uh, credit, the Michigan Credit Union. Uh, uh, but know what it's called, the Michigan Credit Union. It's aimed at the locality. It's aimed at the state. It's aimed at conveying something about the region in which it is set. And certainly in the 19th century, most banks carried a local name in the title. Trustees were local business people. Uh, there were links, of course, be different elements of the system leading to support, backup, and confidence. But local governance and control. It also led to a much greater emphasis on relationships. Uh, thirdly, uh, independence. Independence is a virtue to be cherished. Now, we all understand. We all understand that the history of regulation clearly shows the need to protect uh, the depositor against malpractice. But there was something powerful, both socially and practically, in the operation of an independent local society or bank with a dedicated aim, <coughs> the encouragement of saving or the provision of a benefit. These independent local societies provided fraternity, a supportive environment for the encouragement of saving and self-help. I can't speak in this instance about the, the situation in the US, which I know won't be identical to that in the UK. In the UK, there used to be three people who were absolutely critical to a local community. Uh, the first of those was the minister or priest. Uh, the second uh, was the head teacher of the local school. And the third was the bank manager of the local bank. And those three individuals gave form, shape, and coherence to the meaning of community in local setting after local setting across the land. There are no such thing as local bank managers anymore in the United Kingdom. I don't think there's a single one. And the point I'm seeking to make is the importance of that locality, independence and relationships in, and this is really moving on to my fourth and last uh, point, in the uh, contribution to social cohesion in the heart of a community. Well, this portrait of local independent societies uh, providing for a variety of financial needs of working people is not intended to gloss over difficulties or complexities. However, perhaps in our current landscape of finance and banking, we have centralized and consolidated so much that we have lost sight of the real social and economic benefit derived from greater variety and diversity, more locality and independence, and perhaps more targeted provision. The very concept of a savings bank or a mutual society seems in many instances to have disappeared. Maybe it is time once again to encourage that targeted local provision. Maybe it is time once again to encourage the virtue and prudence of saving. Thank you very much. I think there's going to be questions, and the hands are going up already, so let's uh, go for the first one while I take some water. <coughs> going back to one of your early slides, I'm wondering if you would comment on the wide variation between the UK's saving rate versus the rest of Europe. Mm. I guess I'm not so surprised at the, at the low number for the US, but, but I would, would have expected the UK to be closer to reflecting the rest of Europe. Could you just comment on that? Yes. Um, of course, there's a number of ways in which we consider ourselves completely exceptional compared to the rest of Europe. <laughs> but that wasn't really your question. <laughs> um, and uh, 
Yeah, yes, yeah. In fact, I, uh, uh, so uh, Europe has a much stronger tradition of regional banking. Uh, that would be one uh, point I would make. Uh, uh, Britain is quite centralized uh, in, in a number of ways, and I think that has uh, contributed uh, to that. The second thing I would say is that the institution of the family has been given, I mean, I'm sounding very pro-EU and pro-European pro here, I'm not really any of those, but never mind. Um, uh, but the Europe has a much stronger tradition of support for the family as an institution. Uh, I remember uh, not many years ago being in Rome and uh, there was sort of this street demonstration uh, going on in Rome. Now in London, if there's ever a street demonstration, the best advice is to head in the opposite direction. It will be a bunch of lefties going on about you know, something or the police all be bowing down before them and all the rest of it. What it was uh, in Italy was a protest in support of the family. Uh, and I just thought, oh, I don't think I've ever seen that in the UK. So, uh, although I don't have a magic answer to your question, I think the fact that there's more regional banking in Europe as a tradition, there's more support for the role and institution of the family as the first place of self-help, I think has contributes to more savings. Uh, and in the UK, we have tended to fall increasingly uh, into the trap of assuming that the government is the answer uh, to every question, and therefore, why bother? Why, why would I bother to save if the government will solve the problem? Uh, the fact that the government doesn't solve the problem, of course, is a different matter. Oh, lots more questions. Do you have any historical data that shows the rate of savings as compared or offset by the rates of inflation? Uh, yes, that information is available. I don't have that at the top of, in, I don't have that on my, on my lips and in my head at the moment. That information is definitely available, including as adjusted by uh, inflation. And you see the big changes come, of course, with industrialization. Um, so you tend to have quite a flat line, and then the lines go up as incomes increase, real wages increase, and, and so on and so forth. So the details of that information is available and accessible. I, I don't actually have it on my, uh, uh, on my lips at the moment. Thank you very much. I have, uh, being that you're from the UK, uh, you're not probably as familiar with the Medicaid program, but there is a stipulation in that program that is called an asset test. You have, in order to certify for eligibility, you can have no more than $2,000 of assets as a single or $3,000 as a couple. Um, just curious your thoughts as to the morality of that kind of a provision. Seems that it would entrench people in poverty and discourage the very thrift you're encouraging. Yes, so um, uh, the, um, 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 I mean, I think you kind of <laughs> answered your own question, really, <laughs> as, you, as you answered it. So you have this problem. So uh, I know some of the language sometimes is terribly Victorian, and it's my area of real expertise, sort of Victorian history and uh, historian sort of Christian uh, provision and, and, and so on. Uh, but there was a distinction. I don't, I don't like this terminology, but there was a distinction that was drawn between deserving and undeserving poverty. Now... If you get away from the language, what it meant was, was there somebody here in real need of help for whom we as a community have a responsibility to assist? And that help would normally be temporary and it would be assessed. But it would be assessed on the basis of individuals visiting uh, a, an individual and assessing that need. The problem, the moment you fall into either different levels of state provision or different levels of test for the state provision is, well, that's fine. Let me, uh, let me give the, you know, if I've got some savings, I'll give them away. There's no point saving at all because if I have more than $3,000 or £5,000, I'm not going to get anything from the state. There's no incentive whatsoever. So it disincentivizes the principle of self-help and therefore it increases 
the dependency on the state. And I think, I do, I think there's a place for emergency provision from the state. I think we probably need to be, I think we need to recognize there's always going to be some role on the margins for the state. I think, I think it would be a, I hope you're still going to let me out of the door having said that, and I find I'm quite, quite surprised I'm saying it, really. But I think, there, you know, I think to be honest, that, you know, we, we have to probably accept there is some role at the margin, but when that becomes the central way of making that provision, and when that provision disincentivizes the principle of self-help, I think we have a problem. What is the incentive to do that? 80 million. Yeah, with no incentive at all to do anything about it. I have a question from our live stream audience. Um, this is from Tom Ludden. Um, do you think that 40 years of state-run lotteries and the state-run advertising campaigns that promote playing the lottery as a good thing to do morally because it funds schools, et cetera, does that have a, neg a negative impact on savings? That's a great question, a really interesting question. My, my traditional position is a traditional Christian position that I'm not keen on lotteries. Um, I've, I've had all sorts of debates and discussions with people, including friends, over, but if that's the only way to get the money, what's wrong with that? And people have the choice and the freedom to do that. I think it's a reflection of two things. It's a reflection that we've to got totally upside down what the proper role of the state is, and we have invested too much in the role of the state, and therefore we have too much expectation. And secondly... I think it's a reflection of our own moral compass being turned upside down as a society in which we think that we can game in order to uh, gain the money. What about a complete reversal of both of those principles and say, let's develop a proper role for the state, you know, the defence of the nation, uh, the... Um, what comes after the yeah the defence of the nation, <laughs> the defence of the nation, the provision of law and order, and yes, actually I will be on it, and some emergency provision at the margins when necessary. Let, let, let's let's be clear, uh, but invest the rest of our effort in the development of family life, the development of communities, the development of institutions. That would seem to be far better than depending on either the state or on lotteries. But I suspect I'm, 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 uh, that's probably not a terribly popular position back in the UK, but you know, it's never bothered me before. Which one? <laughs> I, I was wondering if you, uh, not specificity, specificity, but um, savings rates in uh, countries like Russia and China or in the Islamic countries of the Middle East, what their saving rates are comparatively. Um, so again, that's something, that information is definitely available. I just don't know it off the top of my head. So I'm sorry I can't quite answer that, that question directly. Uh, I took a selection. I looked at, I, I, I accessed the, I think it was the, it was either the World Bank or the OECD, um, and I just took a selection. So there is, if you, um, um, I wonder if I've got here where I got it from. Um, just bear with me a moment because I normally reference, of course I haven't referenced my notes there, <laughs> never mind. Um, I think it was the, uh, if, you, if you type into Google uh, 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 savings ratios and go either, I can't remember if it was the World Bank or the OECD, you will have tables covering every country in the world, which you can break down by different groups like the G20 or Europe or so on. Um, so that's where I got the information from, um, and you would be able to track down what those particular countries were. I'm sorry I don't have that information right at the... At the uh, off the top of my head. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that lecture. That was great. Um, I have yet another question about the statistics. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, to what extent um, are savings and investment differentiated? Because I think there there is a mentality, at least in the United States, maybe also in the UK, um, that, well, you don't just want to save, and especially right now. I mean, we, we're living in a context of very high inflation, yeah. right? So cash holdings are going to just lose their value, whereas sure. if you invest. Um, so to what extent might that offset some of the, the, the seeming uh, inequality between yes. uh, nations? I think that was all fair and reasonable comment. And those statistics were specifically savings ratio of household incomes. Uh, so they were specific 
uh, to that. What is interesting as well is during the whole COVID crisis, don't get me started on the COVID crisis, on the whole COVID crisis in the US, and I think in the UK too, but it was very noticeable in the US, that savings ratio for a year went very high. Presumably that's because there was, <laughs> well, I had to go out. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to do, nothing to spend it on. Um, and then it's come back down to a more historic uh, rate. Um, so that was in terms of the, the particular statistics and the particular percentage of household uh, income and so on. Uh, in terms of uh, investment and so on, um, I think the, uh, the, the, I think it's a, uh, so I think it's a reasonable distinction to make when it comes to personal savings. So the encouragement of personal savings for investment, I've argued is a moral imperative. Because of what you said, uh, in fact, I had this in my notes but didn't use it, because of what you said about inflation, that is all, and the effect of inflation, that's also a reminder that inflation is a moral question. And inflation uh, is something that many people have not really experienced. I was talking about this with the chairman of my board last week. Uh, he was making a speech in Parliament. And I said, you know, anyone below the age of 60, in the uh, 50, let's say, in the UK, has never experienced inflation at more than about 2 or 3%. So they don't care. The reason they don't care is they don't realise how destructive morally inflation is. If you want to help the poor, then inflation is not a good thing because it's an arbitrary redistribution without any control whatsoever. Uh, inflation encourages you to take debt uh, because, I mean, you know, if I've got a, a £100,000 or a $100,000 mortgage on my house, if inflation goes up, well, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. I will pay that back at a lower value. So it's two sides of the same coin. So I think uh, the encouragement of investment at an individual level is important, and I think the impact of inflation, because that is destructive to that principle, is also an illustration that inflation itself is a moral principle. One last comment on, on investment by the state, by government. This is probably terribly controversial, I'm really sorry. Um, uh, I read again and again and again how wonderful and marvellous it is for the state to invest in infrastructure. Uh, well, not if the infrastructure is not needed, not if the infrastructure is a white elephant, not if the infrastructure uh, doesn't actually serve the purpose it needs. And we have this in the UK, I'm sure you have it in the US, where you just get government after government saying we must invest more large capital in this, this thing called the infrastructure. And you're never quite sure what it means, and you're never quite sure whether it delivers what it's meant to deliver. So I would make more of a defence morally of investment and the private individual than I would uh, uh, with the state. We have time for one more question. There are two trains of thoughts on the Federal Reserve uh, regarding uh, moral uh, Christian view, uh, credit union banking versus the secular uh, view of banking. Uh, when did that uh, transition happen? Was it, that was just one example, the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Uh, could you just expand on that just a little bit more for me? Are you saying, the f it sounded like you were saying there was a particular moment when the Federal Reserve made a change. We were just, I was just wondering uh, if the Federal Reserve had anything to do from moving uh, the, the conservative bank, uh, the Christian view, more right. to a secular view. Right, okay. So I think the way in which I can respond to that question, and I, I hope I've understood it, uh, is something to do about the relationship of central banking and the impact of the central banks on the culture of a country. And I think uh, both the UK and the US have experienced both the strengths and the weakness of central banking. And as the central banking system, whether it's the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England, has got stronger and stronger and stronger, it seems to have taken an ever more expanding role. And therefore, to the extent that that is true, and I don't know enough about uh, uh, whether that's true in the case of the Federal Reserve, I think the impact is a squeezing out of the local, a squeezing out of certainly anything Christian, and a squeezing out of alternatives. Central banks love centralization. 
So central banks, reserve banks, love the idea that they're the ones who will set the controls. And they and some of that may be necessary, but they expand and they grow in that vision and in those tentacles. And so it then becomes ever harder to have that smaller local faith-based or non-faith-based provision. I hope that's at least attempted to answer your question, and I, I hope I sort of understood it sufficiently. Well, thank you, Dr. Turnbull. Please give a round of applause. Thank, thank you. you very much. Please uh, turn in your name tags and your comment cards. We do read each of them, so turn those in before you leave. Uh, and please keep an eye on acton.org, acton.org, our website. You can, uh, all the great events we have coming up and some of the great content we push through our podcast and other platforms. Um, just three quick things and I'll let you go. Uh, coming up next week, we have an online conference called the Islamic Case for Liberty. And we've compiled some really great thinkers on some uh, Islamic considerations of what it means to live free. And so if you're interested in those co uh, conversations, please join our online conference next week. And of course, June 20 through 23rd is Acton University. Uh, online registration is still open. Our in-person has closed. We're going to enjoy uh, conversations with 750 to 800 people uh, here in uh, the third week of June from all over the world. Really delighted for those conversations. But if you're interested in online, please register there. And then in July, uh, we have our ALS scheduled with George Nash, uh, and he will be speaking on Herbert Hoover versus the Great Depression. And so if you know George Nash, he's the, one of the world's experts in Herbert Hoover in that era. So please join us in uh, any of those capacities in the next few months, and we look forward to seeing you back here in July. Thank you.